Good evening, everyone. I'm the host in today's program, and my co host is Abana. Uh, we will warmly welcome you all uh, with heart uh, full of love. Uh, we are really honored to have our respected adjutant, sir, and my dear presenters. Good evening, Tamiga. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I am honestly uh, thankful, thankful for our adjutant, sir, give this for giving this opportunity. And I hope that all of you prepared well for your presentation and you are ready for that. And first of all, I would like to call uh, Sagitya to present his presentation. Good day to you all. Thanks for host to presenting me. So today I'm going to talk about the story the nighting and the rose so the story the nighting and the rose is written by oscar wilde and he's a, he is a famous writer and it was published in 1888 in a collection of story named the happy prince and other dolls so although it is a children's story but it deals with the philosophical and emotional issues of the children's beyond their understanding so it is also enriched with the wealth of deep meaning. So it is full of the indirect common comments of life that personifications uh, with similes and also symbolisms. So all the stories are product of the times in which they were written. So as well as while it is formed in a pattern of the arcanic fairy tales. So the Nighting and the Rose is a critic and um, satire of its times of the Victorian era. So the Vict Victorian era corresponds with a long lasting region of Queen Victoria, who ruled over the British Empire from 1837 until her death. So this era was defined by a number of themes according to the, the current situation of this era. So the, the increased power of and the merit-based accuracy and the global dominance of British Empire in trade and politics and the rid moral values. So the Victorian morality was entirely de defined around social status of and classes such as uh, low class, high class, and according to the wealth of the people, they were divided. So its central belief was that allied power were entirely defined around the more moral than their social in their selves. And it is also the role of the elites to morally instruct their low class. So the wild users, the writing and the rose, so that's to satire his attitude about the social status and the classes. So let's critically analyze this story. That uh, this story begins with a young boy who is lamenting in his garden for red rose. So the boy is physically very attractive and, and he utters about love and pain tearfully, which shows him as a hero. The nightingale who sings the song about love and he she has a, an unshakable belief on true love overhears him crying and desires to help the student. So she gets inspired by the true love of the student and thinks that at last she had witnessed the love about which she sung all over the lifetime. So she, after searching a good red rose for everywhere, so she comes to the red rose tree where she comes to know about the method of creating a red rose. But for that, she has to sacrifice her life. So she thinks that it is worth dying for the sake of true love and her heart against a throne to transfer the, her heart's blood to stain a red rose with a red color. Here, as the reader can imagine that a red color is a symbol for, of red, true love and the nightingale stains the rose with her own blood, which shows the value of true love and self-sacrifice for true love. So the, when the student sees the rose under his window, he becomes thrilled and plucks it for her girl without thinking about its life once. It shows the materialistic and selfish nature of the people and how slow they are from inside. When the student begin, brings the rose to the girl, she rejects and it values the expensive jewels over it. On the other, other hand, the boy's love fades away in an instant and she starts falling love unrealistic. It also shows the materialism side of society and also the how people value money over selfishness acts and the true feelings. 
so, so the sacrifice of the nightingales goes waste and it is not appreciated by everyone except the red rose tree to you know the seriousness of the uh, sacrifice towards a love so it also shows that the sacrifice made for others are not given importance rather material profits are more important for the people so as well as this is a summary of the story so as well as this poem talks about the several themes of the situations in the time of when it was created so the 18th century was a industrialization time so the people were running after after money so the economic and the people were economically developed so they were running a rat race to catch the good place which anyone can unbeatable for their so this is the message that the writer have are going to convey from the story so as a theme of this story materialism can be also taken in this story in the story that when he finds the red rose he goes to girl and tells her that he has done the impossible so on seeing the red rose the girl says chamberlain nephew nephew has sent me some ju real jewels and everybody knows that the jewels cost for far more than flowers so she further argues that i don't believe you have even got silver buckles to your shoes as the same nephews has so these are the two dialogues of the girl separate her from the people who want to only love but not the luxuries of the life so the at the end that the lives nothing but a waste of time so materialism prevails the love at the end of the story and strengthens the dogma that they it, it is much easier to purchase love nowadays so as well as, well as the story he is a symbol for the materialism the girl represents the her self as a selfish and a rude and also a materialistic girl who wants material only materials perfects so in this time we can also think about the sacrifice of the bird that the theme of sacrifice is explored through the nightingale's self sacrifice in the name of true love and for sake of helping others so when the nightingale sees the student crying for his sweetheart her whole hearted believe in love compels her to help the boy so she decides to help him and goes out of her house in search of the red rose after searching the for it everywhere she comes to know about a way of getting a red rose she have to give her her own blood to white uh, to a white rose to make it red she believes that it is worth for giving her life for a sake of true love so this can be a great sacrifice of the nighting girl that by this activity she she is coming to a major role of the in the society that it's me it can be seen as a unbeatable place for her so and it can be also as a sacrifice a, a love to a true love so and as a next theme we can take in as the true love so in the story the nighting and the rose is a about the nature of love so in the beginning of the story the student claims to be in a love with professor's daughter and is he is crying for red rose because he will dance with her in the balls if he if he will give her, her a red rose so moreover the love between them were going in a conditional so it can be a, taken as a conditional love not a true love and, and the, the nightingale sacrifices her life for the sake of love so she thinks that that is words for satisfy satisfying her life to a true love so this sacrifice shows that true love does not exist but at the end no one appreciate it so oscar wilde is trying to convey that true love does exist but people make it slow and selfish so the student who thinks that he is love he is in love does not truly know the meaning of love when the girl rejects him and his red rose he calls her ungrateful and says that love is a silly and unpractical for the human being which shows him more as a materialist person rather than a true lover as the poem carries the ideas of the oscar wilde through some quotations and we can also use them for the examination which is very effective and significant in the story that yet love is a better than life and what is heart of bird compared to a heart of a man so this is the statement of nightingale the nightingale deliberates for a moment before de deciding to sacrifice her own life to create a 
red rose for the student so she believes that love is a worse dying and for an believes so she believes that the student is worthy of her sacrifice and the second quotation is love is wiser than philosophy through his wise and mighty than power through his mighty so this is a this is also a statement of nightingale and she nightingale shows her unshakable belief in the in love as a dominating force in the universe so this belief is how she justifies what amounts of her to her suicide and the third quotation is everybody knows that jewels cost more than flowers so this is the effective and significant quotation of the professor's daughter that the professor's daughter rejects the student's gift because it doesn't match to her new dress so she also isn't impressed by with it because she received jewels from the nephew of chamberlains so th- this statement directly contradicts the nightingale's earlier pronouncement that love is priceless and above petty materialism so as well as in the story the writer is also conveying the message of the unpractical life that the student is a bookworm who only reads the wise men's philosophy so according to the wise practical according to the theoretical life she thinks that love is a wonderful and a great thing but when he realized the pain of the girl rejects he realized that that love is a silly thing and a waste of time so according to the writer the age of the boy is an it's just a attraction between the two phenomenal characters so this am i analyzing of the story i think on the rose and thanks for hearing me thank you sir again for your wonderful presentation next i would like to call upon arunavi to talk about the poem war is kind War is Kind by Stephen Crane. Uh, War is Kind by Stephen Crane indicates the psychological torment which the dying soldier and their loving ones are uh, endure instead of uh, focusing on the glory and the heroic st- sentiment. It was published in 1891, I mean the 19th century less than the year before the Stephen Crane uh, died. Uh, Stephen Crane was born in uh, America uh, he has the first hand experience in war and as a, a civil war reporter uh, and the poem the novel he uh, uh, he wrote the red badges of courage also relevant to the theme of civil war which makes him more more famous during that days as a reporter in civil war he has seen many soldiers and their unhealthy un- uh, unhealthy condition in trenches and their pains uh, pains and he realized what the world who know about the soldiers world is thinking that the soldiers are dying and it is their uh, glory and the dying for the mother country is something a uh, very holy thing something very uh, good thing but it's not it's not true when we focus of uh, focus in each and every soldier's life we can understand their pains and their loving ones pains so we can suggest that the title of the poem may be the irony or the paradox in the first stanza uh, writer addresses the maiden who suggests as an uh, unmarried woman who loved uh, who is who loved the soldier who died in the battlefield uh, battlefield is a place where many people lost their precious life we all know that our lives are precious uh, uh, we can uh, once experience that time and here the image of the dying soldier the pain of the person who is connected with him clearly portrayed the uh, portrayed the harsh image of the war uh, the riddleless uh, horse which comes alone uh, to the home indicates the harshness of the war in war there's no helps most innocents are being uh, died in the civil war and being targeted by the uh, cruel people and they are being died because of war so war can't be an option to the to get our needs war is not about who is right it's only about who is left and the great battle 
the great battle god is referred to the mass the god of the uh, roman mythology by saying that these men were born to trill and die and that and the little souls the speaker at once draws the attention to the uh, uh, attention to the soldiers and here the poet draws the image of the soldier as an robo who is all always programmed to do the things which are programmed by uh, the authoritative authoritative people here the soldiers feelings are caged the sound of the uh, loud drums indica indicates the harshness of the battlefield these men were born to drill and die indicates these soldiers are facing their death faster than the ordinary people in the society they always born to die the third stanza is similar to the same type of intimate setting as a first stanza it is in the speaker it is in the first stanza style as speaker is asking a baby uh, not to cry uh, like uh, the maiden uh, uh, to not to cry after telling that the baby's father died violently in a jello trench the speaker ironically states that war is not war is not kind as the color jello is often the symbol uh, comes as a symbol of sickness and disease the phrase jello trench indicates the unhealthy conditions of the soldiers uh, in the battlefield and in the in the trenches and it also suggests that uh, many soldiers in that era i mean the when the writer wrote this amazing poem uh, most of the american soldiers died because of the jello fever in an in unhealthy trenches and it also portrayed uh, through this amazing stanza uh, the fourth stanza uh, returns us to the heart of the battlefield where the flag blazes we all know that, know that the flag blazes are uh, it means the glory of the country then the poet states that uh, uh, these men are born to trill and die which is the repetition indicates the cruelty and the real face of the war which used the soldiers as the victims in this stanza the flag can be seen uh, can be re represent the society while the previous stanzas have been focused on the brutality of the war this stanza points uh, points out the cruelty uh, cruelty and the uh, uh, knowledge knowledgeless society that knowingly since the since the young people we all know that many soldiers died in the uh, battlefield they are youngsters so the uh, so the society which knowingly sends its young men to die and kill others it projects that some people are in favor of war and many can't understand the cruelty the real cruelty of the war because of such people unless we don't have any experience in war soon we can't realize the unseen a uh, true face of the harsh war which is not kind but through this amazing poem a uh, poet touched all the readers hearts with with the sentimental message and some people convinced the youngsters by telling the war as a kind and some are believing that it is the glory to die in the battlefield for their motherland but it's not uh, we all know that the soldiers are unhappily died because of the uh, tortures of uh, the higher position people the poem's fifth and final stanza uh, reverts back to the intimate setting uh, the speaker implores the mother whose heart is humble as button not to weep but it is also uh, suitable to the stanza 1 and the stanza 2 the comparison of the mother's love is something insignificant as a button which is always uh, in the uniform represents the way in which the war ignores the experience of the individuals and the pains of the soldiers loving ones here the uh, speaker seems as he is ignoring the uh, pain of the soldier by telling the uh, mother's heart as a humble button which is always pinned in the uniform uniform the maiden the baby and the mother are all met with the same phrase do not weep and war is kind even the structure of the poem ironically uh, shows the 
contradictions in our society's view of the war. The poem strongly proved that the war is a uh, cruel and it is the hell. It is not unhind. The famous quote says that the war is a symptom of the man as a thinking animal and the war is a, uh, war is a game which was uh, played with the a smile in the face, but there won't be the, uh, the uh, smile in the heart anymore. And we all know that the war, uh, in the war, there are no unwanted soldiers. So we can understand that every soldiers, uh, who, each and every soldiers who are in the battlefield are uh, tend to die and tend to be wounded. And this ironical theme was highly portrayed in this poem. And as I mentioned earlier, the war is not kind, but it is a uh, hell even. Uh, we all know that in disaster times, uh, we can get many humanity service, but in war soon, we can't accept any humanity service and the humanity uh, is uh, was caged. People in the war ignore the uh, other people and they see them as they are victims, even though they are also the humans uh, and it's, uh, I think it is the big mistakes of our uh, human beings. Uh, we all know that uh, we may think that uh, the uh, being in the part, being pa the part of the war or dying in the war can help the people in our country from the country which is against us. But the war is not kind and it is very, it is useless as it takes both sides uh, side of life. Even though during the war time, soldiers sacrifices their life, they didn't get enough glory as well. As I told you earlier, war didn't, uh, exp uh, war didn't determine who is right. It, all, it always determined who is left. Uh, let's analyze the poetic techniques. This poem was written in a, a second person narrative point of view where the narrator comes as a lecturer who, who is lecturing the events, the, who is lecturing the real experiences of the war as a war reporter. Uh, there is a irregular rhyming pattern and uh, this poem was created in a, as this poem, this poem has irregular rhyming pattern. Uh, this poem was created in the free verse. The poem, we can all, we all know that the poem starts with the tone of irony um, where the poet is addressing the war as a very kind thing, but we all know that the war is not kind. Uh, there are many metaphors here, for example, the wild hands, the field where a thousand crops lies comes as a hyperbole which draws the harshness and the cruelty of the war. Here, the battle gold is an allusion which indicates the Roman god of war. Uh, drilled and die comes as a comes as an alliteration, uh, and, and humble as a button comes in a simile where the mother's heart is uh, uh, compared to the uh, button which is in the usually put in the uniforms. There is a color symbol in the. Uh, line as I told you earlier, it indicates the unhealthy and the uh, unhealthy condition of the soldiers in the general changes and their flights in that situation. Moreover, this poem is uh, very rich in visual and kinesthetic imagery, where the poet uh, uh, we can uh, visualize all the things which was happening in the war, and uh, we can understand the harshness of the war truly without uh, referring to any notes or other things. And I think uh, it is the magical thing which uh, hidden in this poem. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Arnavi, for providing a wonderful presentation uh, by, with the points. Now I would like to call Sharmadi to speak on uh, The Evening Star by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Good evening, everyone. To The Evening Star by William Blake. Uh, William Blake was born on 28th November 1757. He was an English painter, poet, and printmaker uh, who lived in a romantic era. And now let's uh, analyze the poem uh, by line by line. Um, uh, to the evening star is an audit to the star Venus. Uh, 
according to greek mythology venus is a roman goddess uh, of uh, fertility beauty and love um, William Blake and other people in the Romantic era believed that uh, Venus will uh, protect them in the night time uh, against the evils. Uh, the star represents a transcendent symbol um, uh, between the struggles of oppositions like female and male, um, trident and slave and uh, day and night. Uh, though fair-haired angel of the evening now whilst the sun rest on the mountain slide as the poet begun the uh, poem he gives a direct reference to the uh, to the star as an angel uh, he gives a female uh, characteristic to the angel as calling her fair-haired angel of the evening um, as the sun uh, sets behind the mountains, um, as the sun sets behind the mountains, the star uh, begins to uh, appear in the night sky. Thy bright torch of love, thy radiant crown, put on and smile upon our evening bed. Um, we can, we know that um, the bright, the light of the bright torch so we could uh, know that um, um, Venus is, uh, is a symbol of love too uh, the poet requests the um, requests the angel to wear the glowing crown and to smile on uh, smile upon their evening evening bed evening bed represents the uh, threats issues and corruption in romantic era so they uh, they can be sold by her blessed smile blue curtains of the sky smile on our loves and while though draw us the blue curtains of the sky scatter thy silver silver dew on every flower that shuts its sweet eyes in timely sleep um, the poet request uh, uh, the star to smile on her loud ones angel, angelic uh, character of angel uh, is pleased to see her children in happiness um, at the same time the poet requests uh, her to spread the uh, holy water drops on every flowers that shuts his uh, sweet eyes uh, sweet eyes in uh, in the night time let thy west wind sleep on the lake speak silence with thy glimmering eyes um, the poet um, requests the star to let the wind sleep on the uh, lake and he also asks to um, calm down the spirit of wind uh, in the lake and uh, he asks uh, the fair head angel to speak silently uh, with her glimmering eyes so it can be a uh, it can heighten the um, beauty of the landscape and wash the dusk with the silver uh, dusk represents the evening uh, the, with the, the evening star to wash out the um, corruptions and uh, darkness uh, with her silver uh, in the evening soon full soon dust though withdraw as the as these lines are said by the poet uh, he we could know that he realizes that it is very temporary and soon when the night falls she will disappear in the darkness in night uh, leaving the poet and others um, in danger then the wolf rages wide and then the lion glass through the dun forest uh, the wolf indicates the uh, evilness of night and the lion uh, represents the shiny morning uh, which gives hope to the race to next day. Um, the wolf and the lion symbolize the experience that, that will come out through the dark forest. Um, 
the fleeces of our flocks are covered with thy sacred dew protect them with thine influences the poet knows that her absence will uh, lead the dark forces uh, to capture the landscape uh, that a few moments ago it was with uh, it was filled with divine uh, divine power and purity however at last the poet requests the um, evening star to protect the fleece of flocks with uh, her sacred uh, holy drops uh, that were taken in early hours of the day to protect uh, as long as um, uh, the poem as long as the star uh, put her influence in her creatures the dark forces cannot um, cause uh, harm to the um, to the people um, in the to the evening star poem william blake used uh, many literary devices such as metaphors or personification and assonance uh, though fair haired angel of the evening uh, there are some consonants used in the um, line so it can be uh, considered as assonance fair haired angel bright torch of love radiant crown our evening bed blue curtains sweet eyes glimmering eyes are considered as metaphors and uh, uh, as i um, said in the beginning uh, to the evening star uh, is an odey of uh, venus put on an and smile though draws the blue curtains wind sleeps speaks silence wash the dusk though with protect them are some of the personification used here thank you Thank you, Sir Mali. You did your presentation very well. Next, I would like to call uh, Sakithi and to uh, talk about the prose "The Lagora Attack" by Kumar Sangakkara uh, from Colin Cowdery Lecture. A great warm good evening to you all. I am going to present about a speech in the topic "The Lagora Attack" by Kumar Sangakkara in Co Colin Cowdery Lecture. which was delivered on 5th of july 2011 at lords kumar sangakkara was born on 27th of october 1977 in mathala he is the youngest of four children he was he has two sisters and a brother he is the former captain and left hand batsman of the sri lankan cricket team not only in the top order batsman he used to play as a wicket keeper too He has ranked as the number one Test batsman in the world several times during his career. He had won many awards in his career too. It was a moment of enormous pride of Sri Lankan when Kumar Sangakkara delivered the 11, 2011 MCC Spirit of Cricket Covered Lecture on July 4, 2011 at Lords. touching on the history culture role of cricket and opportunities of for cricket in a country liberated for the clutches of terrorism it gave a huge uplift for sri lanka at a time when it its international image was being sullied by groups with a political agenda kumar sangakkara starts his speech by telling his audience about the history of sri lanka and his people he is proud of his country heritage country's heritage close knit families strong communities and expect ex, exceptionally hospitable hospitable culture he describes how the games first provides an op opportunity for affluent sri lankans of all races create caste and religious beliefs to come together to indulge a shared passion when a game is open to the masses it solidifies the place of this very english game in sri lankan hearts the school and cowardly lecture by kumar sangakkara was narrated in the first person view point of view 
the main he maintains a patriotic talking way in this speech the whole world mesmerized by his speech because of his sincerity dignity and patriotism in the speech he emphasizes his love kindness and care to the, his team players and to the poor people in the world he also describes the responsibilities of a leader in cricket team and in the country too this speech reveals the qualities of sangakkara as a great sri lankan and as a humanist humanist to the world commenting on lahore attack sangakkara begins by saying that he had never experienced a war directly before because of the place which he lives in uh, in the text we can see this was an experience that i could not relate to i had great sympathy and compa- compassion for them but had no real experience which with which i could not draw parallels by this line we can say that he had a great sympathy to the people that who were affected by the war but he didn't face the war uh, directly in his life in the flow of the speech kumar sangakkara Uh, explain his first experience of a war or a bomb blast but he didn't face on his own country uh, in the text uh, that the thing was described as that was until we took pakistan in 2009 by this line we can simply understand that kumar sangakkara had his first experience of a war in pakistan next in the speech he expresses the emotions of his teammates about the match the second test was along mandarin the also mandarin along with the spilling up a big first innings when we departed from the ground on day 3 having been asked to leave early instead of waiting for the pakistan bus we were at we were anticipating a day of hard toil for bowlers by this line we can say, see the pain commitment to the play of the cricket players for each match they had played on and he also mentioned the tough game day for his team bowlers sangakkara also invo- informs us the duty and responsibility of a leader in the team in the speech Uh, by the la- by the para at the back of the bus the fast bowlers were loud in their complaints i remember tilan tusara was particularly vocal complaining that his back was near breaking point he joked that he wished if a bomb would blast in lahore they can leave lahore and go back to sri lanka this para indicates as the a life of cricket players and pressure around the captain of a team in this incident the wish of tilan tusara is an accidental utterance it shows us the potential danger of a sri lankan team players the, then he goes on on to recount the attack in a vivid and dramatic style not 30 seconds had passed uh he had passed we were we heard what sounded like firecrackers going off 